Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from Olympia to now. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympics and Paralympics, and we love history. And most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history, especially when it gives us the chance to highlight some athletes who might otherwise be forgotten about. And today that means sharing the story of George Iser, who we briefly mentioned in our last episode about the hot mess that was the St. Louis Olympics in 1904. He was one of the few bright spots in that Olympiad because, in my opinion, he embodied the Olympic spirit, especially in terms of persistence and love of his sport, which was gymnastics. And, of course, being a gymnastics family, I'm a little biased about that, but... (laughs) Yeah, so like previous episodes we've done highlighting athletes, no real highlights today. We're just going to jump right in and talk about George. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Sarah, how much did you know about George before we started the podcast? Had you ever read his story, heard his story? What's your familiarity level? Yeah, I feel like I remember his name just knowing that he was in the history books, but I did not Mm. know his story. Um the background, anything like that. Um, Just, he was a very successful gymnast. Yeah, same. And and actually, I had never heard of him before I started doing the research for the St. Louis episode. And then this guy jumped off the page at me. He was like, I've never heard this story of George Iser. So this will probably be a pretty short episode because since this was over 100 years ago, we don't have a ton about his life. But Again, we partially started up this show because we want to make sure these people don't get forgotten about. They're worth talking about. It's worth highlighting their stories. And even though we don't know much about them, let's keep that alive. Let's keep that memory going. Just a little bit of background on George. Uh, George Louis Iser was born on August 31st, 1870 in Kiel, Germany. He was an only child to his parents, George Sophus Jasper Iser and Augusta Frederica Henrietta Iser. When he was 14 years old, his parents decided to immigrate to the U.S. I did not find in the research why they decided to do this, but uh, for whatever reason, they came to the U.S. and they settled down in Denver, Colorado. So, hey, Denver. And George then became a U.S. citizen in 1894, when he was 24 years old. And then the next thing that we really know about him is that in 1902, he decided to leave Denver to move to St. Louis, Missouri, so that he could work as a bookkeeper for a construction company. So good for him. Numbers guy. Not my thing, but glad he was comfortable with them. And... It's around this same time that he decided to join the local gymnastics club, Concordia Turnverein, St. Louis. So here was something that I thought was really interesting, was that members of these clubs were called Turners, short for Turnverein. And that was a term I had heard before. I just never understood the connection. Uh, But it's an old term that you'll see sometimes used for gymnasts. So besides being a place to keep fit, these clubs also served as an ethnic and cultural center since most of their members tended to have German heritage. Um, So Sarah, you'll remember we've talked about this before that back in the 1896 games, the Germans dominated the gymnastics competition. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was something really important in, in their culture. So had you ever heard this word Turners before? I feel like maybe, but maybe I'm just getting it confused with a different gymnastics club or something like Turner's gym club, but, but that's different than this, you know, like, how yeah. I mean, so I don't know. I'm trying to jog my memory on that, but yeah. um, I did not realize that there were clubs like this that were serving the needs of people to celebrate their culture and stuff. Um yeah. So, yeah, that's super interesting to see the intersection of it being about sports and fitness, but also 
their culture. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about it. When he moved here to the U.S., being 14 years old, obviously, as an adult, he wants to connect with people who speak his native language, people who know the culture. I, I think that's important for anyone to want to connect to their heritage. So it makes sense that places like this would have popped up around the U.S. where he could just, you know, literally walk in the door and have friends <laughs> right away and mm -hmm. have a community around him, right. especially being so far away from his family at this point. So, um, so yeah, so we know those are the things that we know about him in terms of how he ended up in uh, St. Louis. But, uh, but yeah, I'm going to let you kind of pick things up from, from there. Yeah. So the specific details have been lost to time, but it was around this time that George was in an accident where his left leg was run over by a train. Ouch. We are, yeah. <laughs> uh, we are not exactly sure how it happened, but it was so badly damaged that it had to be amputated. Mm. It was replaced with a wooden prosthetic, and despite this setback, Iser continued to excel at gymnastics winning some local and regional competitions, and then set his eyes on the 1904 Olympic Games after it was announced the Games would be moving from Chicago to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty pretty great that he figured out how to still do gymnastics, and not only to participate in it, but to excel. So there were actually two different gymnastics competitions that featured in the St. Louis Games, and he participated in both. The first was the International Turners Championship. There's that word, Turners, again. <laughs> and this competition was held on July 1st and July 2nd. It included an all-around event, a triathlon, and the team events. The St. Louis Republic newspaper wrote on July 2nd, 1904, the German Turners are all tall, husky-looking chaps, each being at least <laughs> six feet tall, weighing on an average of 185 pounds. It could plainly be seen when one of the Turners left the apparatus if he was a member of the German team or not, as each of these stood erect as an arrow when through this when through with his exercise. Um, so that's pretty wild that you know today we think of gymnasts as being certainly strong and tough, but usually not tall. Is like <laughs> tall, husky-looking chaps is not what we think of when it comes to gymnast. Yeah. Um, so, so just to see how the sport has evolved over the years. <laughs> yeah, but but still um, muscular, still very very much muscular. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my goodness, like, yeah, th those guys for the Turner's Championship. George struggled. He placed tenth in the nine event all around competition, and so this included doing three routines on both the horizontal bar and the parallel bars two routines on pommel horse, and then one vault attempt. Then there was also a separate gymnastic all-around event where he placed 71st. Yeah, so I had to do some digging on this because it was very confusing to me at first, but I think I understand it now. So this other all-around event, it was a combination of the nine routines that you just mentioned where he had ended up in 10th. So, so he did pretty well in that, right? Like ended up 10, maybe he was hoping to do better, but, but then they added on as a separate all around event. They said, okay, we're going to take those nine things that you already did. And now we're going to add on an athletic triathlon. So three more events in track and field. So Unfortunately, he finished in dead last in all three of those events for the Athletics Triathlon, which is what dragged him from 10th in the nine event competition down to 71st in the 12 event competition. Again, very confusing because we don't do things like mm -hmm. that anymore, but right. I had to read this multiple times before I finally understood what they were talking about. And another thing, too, is when I say triathlon, don't think of it the way we think of it today. There was no swimming. There was no cycling. Instead, this triathlon consisted of a 100-meter yard dash, long jump, and shot put. 
So his scores were really hurt because he had only managed a 13 foot long jump. And I say only managed, like, I mean, honestly, I don't think that really sounds that bad, especially considering the guy had one working leg. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and also, yeah. uh, he ran the 100 yard dash in 15.4 seconds. But again, wooden leg for crying out loud. Okay. Like 15.4 seconds for a hundred meter yard dash is actually really good when you consider that, but yeah. you know, regardless, he ended up last in all of those. So it, it just boom, brought his score down to, to where he was 71st instead of finishing 10th after the nine events. So yeah. So meanwhile, there was also the team events going on. And unfortunately, in the team scoring, his club ended up in fourth place. So they just missed out on being on the podium. So, you know, all in all, just kind of a couple of disappointing days that probably didn't go the way that they, they really hoped and what they knew they were capable of. Now, I know that you watch gymnastics on mm -hmm. TV, but I can't remember. Have you ever actually gone to a live gymnastics meet? Yeah, yeah, for men's and women's. Okay, mm -hmm. men's and yeah. women's. And I know okay. that you have, being a gym fan. <laughs> yes, and, and I've also been to both, because long before mm -hmm. I got married or anything, um, I lived in a city where uh, there were two colleges, and one of those colleges was actually known for having a, a really pretty decent women's yeah. gymnastics program. And so there was one time a friend of mine was going to the meet and said, hey, do you want to come along? And I was like, of course I want to come along. I, I love watching gymnastics. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I've been to, to both men's and women's. And of course, you know, it's very different now because you've got four events in women's. You've got six events in men's. And if you only watch gymnastics on TV, unfortunately, a lot of times with the men's event, they cut out some of the mm -hmm. events. Um, like I know this at the Tokyo Games, my my mom texted me <laughs> at one point because she said, where was the rings? I love watching men's rings and they didn't show it <laughs> at all. You know, and I, I told her, I said, yeah. well, Technically, you could go on to Peacock, you could go watch the replay, right. and you could see the whole thing if, if you want to go do that. But it's going to, you're going to be sitting there for three, four hours watching <laughs> the entire thing. Yeah. Um, it's like if you don't have an American that's expected to meddle in the event, they're not going to show it in prime time, unfortunately. Right. So, yeah. So, this competition that I just described, part of what was hard for me to understand it is it sounds so different than what I'm used to seeing when I go to a meet. Um, and frankly, really convoluted and confusing. Like, hey, you're going to do nine events for this all around, but then we're going to send you out to the track to go do these other three for a separate all around event. So, so yeah, so that's that. But then later on in the year, so this all happened in July that we were just talking about later on in the year on October 29th, that was when they did the individual events. And so this is a different story for George. So he's had some time to, you know, get some more training in, leave that <laughs> disappointment behind. So this second gymnastics competition, it was called the Olympic Gymnastics Championships. And it included the seven individual apparatus events because rope climbing was a thing. So... That's why, again, the numbers are different than what we see today. And it also included the combined event, which is what we would think of as the all-around. So he has another chance at an all-around spot, just mm -hmm. a, a little bit more traditional. So he competed in five events total out of the seven possible apparatuses. Uh, four of those events were used to determine the individual all around. So for listeners who maybe don't know gymnastics as well, at the Olympics now, those are completely separate contests. The all around contest has nothing to do with your scores from the team event or individual right. apparatus. Yeah, you get a complete clean slate. That wasn't the case here. The case here was we're going to take your scores from the events, and we're going to add those together, which is actually how they do it at a lot of meets still. 
So my son, when he competes, they don't do a separate all around event. It's just a combination of his scores from all the apparatuses. So same thing happening here. Anyway, and I think it was a time thing. They wanted to get this all done in one day, mm -hmm. <laughs> which again, yeah. gymnastics now takes place across pretty much the entire two weeks of the Olympic Games because of how they split it up. But uh, but anyway, so here he is. He has a fresh start. He has a chance to compete in these five events and even go for the all-around. So, Sarah, how did he do this time around? All right. Here's how he finished on each event. Okay. Horizontal bar, he got bronze. Side horse, also known as pommel horse, he got silver. He picked up gold in parallel bars. Rope climbing, he got gold. Horse vault, a.k.a. vault. Um, so <laughs> the vault that we're used to running and, you know. Um, so different than the vault pommel horse, but yeah. horse vault. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, and I, it's, yeah, we'll yeah. talk about this in a second, but it's actually not like the vault we're used yes. to. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, I, we'll get I, there. <laughs> it, yeah. It's, it's a little bit different, but more yeah. traditional. So he got gold in horse vault. And then the individual all around for the four events, he got silver. That's six medals in a single day, which is still a record and probably won't be beaten since events are more spread out now. Yeah. His primary competition came from fellow American Anton Haida, who also won uh, six medals that day, five gold, one silver. In fact, they actually tied for golden vault, mm. unlike vault today. The horse vault event required three jumps where your scores were totaled together. Unlike today with the table vault where you get two attempts and the judges only count the score of your best attempt. Yeah. And so I, I can't remember if I have this later on in the notes, but I'm going to go ahead and say it now. Um, so, so the horse vault, <laughs> um, there was no springboard. So, you know, table vault, uh, as we think of it today, you know, they run, they hit the springboard, you know, they use the the vault table to launch themselves up into the air. They do all their cool flips and everything, and then they land. Um, so, yeah, this looked very, very different, but it's cool that they, they tied for the gold in that. And also, I kind of want to backtrack to these events. So, okay, horizontal bar side horse, like you said, what we would think of as pommel horse today, and P bars. All three of those are events, uh, well, and rope climbing too. All four of those are events where it's more about your upper body strength. So that's part of obviously why he was able to excel in those events, even though he mm -hmm. was missing a leg, is he could really rely on his upper body for, for most of those things. So I say all that to say that's what actually makes the horse vault gold so impressive is because you didn't have a springboard. It wasn't just about upper body strength. You did have to be able to jump really well. And he was working with just one leg <laughs> to be able to do that. So um, on that note, Sarah, there's a video I found on Facebook of Horse Vault mm -hmm. so that you can see how it's different than the modern one. And we're going to mm -hmm. link this in the show notes, but uh, we've never done this on the show before, but I'm going to have you watch this video right now <laughs> while we're recording and describe what you see. So do you have the link there? Yes. And I have okay. it open and the video is okay, playing. Cool. Yeah. It appears to be a very tall horse. Yes. Um, and... <laughs> And if you remember the vaults of years past, like, um, think like 96, 2000, before it became the vault table, um, it looks similar shape wise, yeah. um, but a lot taller. Um, and then, yeah, it happens kind of fast in this video. So I'm going back to rewatch it. Uh, so it's coming up right now. So yeah, I mean, it is, you got one guy on the horse yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and then you got the other guy that is like running and like pulling himself up over the horse and then like throwing himself over. It's almost like a straddle <laughs> over. Yeah. If you will. Um, yeah. It's, it's very different. And then you have like another guy that hops on the horse and actually like sits on the horse with his buddy. So, right. 
yeah, this may have been a, a practice, like a video that was taken like during practice. Sure. Like this may not be like from the actual event, yeah. right? But, uh, but it's, it, I think, it, again, we'll link it so that people have a context for what it looked like, because it does look very different than what we're used to as the vault of it. <laughs> yeah, but. like the one that looks most similar to this day is probably the horizontal bar, because um, they have rope yeah. climbing on the video as well. Yeah, things have changed quite a bit. So yeah, uh, it's a video worth seeing for sure. Yeah, parallel bars is probably fairly similar too. I mean, they definitely do yeah. some different things than what they did back then, but still. Yeah, I, I thought it was a cool video and just kind of gives context for what he had to do and why that gold medal is even more impressive based on how high he had to be able to jump off of one leg. Mm -hmm. So, um, So yeah ridiculously high really impressive um again no springboard all those things and and yeah this was not the event where he could depend on his upper body strength so so there's all that going on let's kind of talk a little bit about his legacy and kind of you mm -hmm. know the impact he has made yeah so just like charlotte cooper who we discussed a couple episodes back. George is yet another example of a disabled athlete excelling in competition against able-bodied competitors because there was no Paralympic movement yet. And there still wouldn't be for another half century. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2008, Iser was the only person with an artificial leg to have competed in the Olympics. That changed when South African swimmer Natalie Dutois participated in the 10 kilo swimming marathon during the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics. She lost her left leg in a traffic accident, but managed to finish 16th in the competition. So kind of like George losing his leg in an accident, she had mm -hmm. a, I guess, a little bit of a similar story there. Just. Yep. And then, um, of course, a lot of people know that in the 2012 London Summer Olympics, you had Oscar Pistorius, another South African, by the way, uh, who we will eventually cover when we get there. That's just going to be quite a while. Uh, but uh, Pistorius competed in both the 400 meter and the 4 by 400 meter relay at the Olympic Games. And in case you don't know about him, Pistorius is a double leg amputee with the nickname of Blade Runner. ESPN did a really great 30 for 30 documentary series on him called The Life and Trials of Oscar Pistorius. I highly encourage everyone to go watch that because it is fascinating and his story is really interesting in a lot of different ways. Uh, but we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to him. Anyway, so back to Iser. So that's kind of the legacy that he was the only athlete for over 100 years who competed at the Olympics with a prosthetic. Just amazing. Uh, but after his Olympic success, Iser continued competing for the Concordia Turners. He was part of their winning team at the 1908 International Meet in Frankfurt, Germany. So they got to, got to go back home to Germany, compete on the world stage there. And then he was also a part of the 1909 National Meet that was held in Cincinnati, Ohio. At some point... Again, this is where details are fuzzy because it was so long ago. But at some point, he moved back to Denver. I couldn't find any information exactly why, but I assume it was probably to be with his parents or help them out. They maybe were getting up in age or had gotten sick. Again, we don't know. I'm just guessing here why he would mm -hmm. have moved back sure. to Denver. Um, and then, unfortunately, really, the only other thing that we know about him after that is he himself passed away on March 6th, 1919 in Denver at only 48 years old. Um, again, not sure what happened. If there was sickness in the family or something happened, but um, gone too soon. That's too young. Um, yeah. He's now included in the Gymnastics Hall of Fame. And if you go to our show notes, you can find a link to a picture of his wooden prosthetic leg that he used, which is also pretty impressive technologically given the time that it was made in. So, you know, again, kind of like the, you know, kind of like Charlotte Cooper, kind of like Elena de Portales, you know, that's really all we know about him just because a ton wasn't getting documented, but, uh, 
But yeah, but that's that's the life of George Iser. As we continue to discuss the games, it's important that we take a moment to remember athletes like George, even if we don't have a ton of information about them. Because at the end of the day, he did truly embody the Olympic spirit. He was dealt a bad card when he lost his leg, and he didn't let that hold him back. And next week, we will be talking about the intercalated games that were held in Athens in 1906. I'm really excited about this topic. Honestly, this was one of the topics that really made me want to start this show. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to talking about them, even though they're not considered an official Olympiad. We'll get to that next time. But mm -hmm. if you enjoyed this episode, and we really hope you did. Then we hope you'll connect with us online. You can find our social media links in the show notes. Reach out and say hi to us. Send us a message if you've got a suggestion. We're open to stuff. <laughs> but until then, ought to see you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content be in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.